Hi, and welcome back to the Welby Show and Podcast. I am so thrilled to have Christian Gonzalez here with me today. He practices naturopathic oncology and specializes in environmental medicine and mind-body medicine. So all the things that I am fascinated by and the Welby community is as well. Christian, thank you so much for being on the show today. What a pleasure to join. I'm, you know, if I can impart any of my experience uh, with anyone, new audience or audience who's heard me speak before, then you know that's the blessing in itself. So thank you for bringing me on the show. Of course, I'm 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 honored to have you. So I have a ton of questions for you because in my holistic patient advocacy work, I have now worked with private clients who have you know cancer, even stage four cancer, uh, very serious kinds of cancer, and it's been a real learning experience for me to support them because cancer patients and cancer care is just so different from other kinds of chronic disease and chronic symptoms. So what made you decide to complete your residency in oncology and how does integrative or naturopathic oncology differ from uh, conventional cancer treatment today? Because I'm sure a lot of people listening to this haven't gone through it, so aren't exactly sure what it entails. And also what drew you to naturopathic oncology over mainstream or conventional oncology? I guess to understand what drew me, it, it would be better to lay the foundation of, I thought I was going to be a dentist and I was in dental school and my loved one, uh, my mom got sick with breast cancer uh, in my like, right around the end of my first semester, right before the holidays. And it was interesting to see when I came back home and I, I went with her, I was home for like three weeks when I went back home uh, to her, I mean, I went to her visits, I, I noticed how much of a disconnect there was between lifestyle, nutrition, and the traditional cancer therapies that were given between the whole team. And then I saw the nutritionists following really the protocols that a lot of the time are sponsored by these big companies, right? So give it, you know, my mom was went home with like a whole box of like Boost and Insure, right? And, and I don't know if the viewers or listeners know about this, but these are super sugary, calorically dense, which is great. That's what you know we want to give cancer patients who are losing weight. But at, at the expense of getting good calories, you're getting a really crappy product, super inflammatory product, high sugar, super processed, something that we can do better at. So I was just really interested at looking at this because I at the time I didn't have nutritional training, but I understood that this there could be better. And, um, you know, over the next year, she got more and more sick and passed away. But it really drove me to go into oncology and go into my residency in oncology, because I wanted to understand how we can bridge a gap or do better by these patients, right? Because essentially, what we're doing in cancer right now is symptom management, and hopeful for curative, and a lot of people, yeah, they, they, they get traditional cancer therapy and it's a curative result, but more people, much more people, the result is that it comes back much more aggressively. And it's because there's a major gap in cancer care. We're not looking at the preventative aspect first and foremost, how are we empowering people in their twenties, in their thirties, in their forties, right? To prevent cancer, because there's evidence-based interventions that do, but we're also treating the end stage manifestation of the body, right? So the body's creating a cancer for a certain reason and we're not working with the body, but instead removing it. Just like a callus is in the hand. It would be silly to go to a callus doctor and get radiation and chemo to remove a callus when essentially you're doing the same thing when you get back home and they say you're callus free and you get back home and then you create another callus, right? The major gap is that we don't empower folks who their results show no cancer to go home and know what to do. What caused the cancer? How do we prevent it? One of the most cringeworthy things that I hear when I was in my residency was when an oncologist goes, your scans are clear, go back home, go back to the life that you had, go, go back to doing what you do, you know, live life. Great, live life, but make those interventions. But unfortunately, those oncologists are not tooled, that's on their tool belt, those interventions, nor is it with the nutritionist, nor is it with anyone else. In comes people who are trained like naturopathic or functional doctors to bridge that gap in oncology. And it's very simple. In my residency, integratively, I helped cancer patients go through chemo, radiation, and surgery. It's day and night. The patients who chose to work with naturopathic oncology, the department, went through those all three treatments 
much, much better. I'm talking about day and night better than if they chose not to, right? Chemotherapy will beat you up. Radiation will beat you up. Surgery will beat you up. Most people get these in the span of six months. So helping these people, holding their hands, giving them the evidence-based protocols that helps reduce inflammation, helps reduce nausea, right? Helps, helps them gain their strength, their energy, their gut issues. We can support that so they go through it much stronger. But the biggest intervention that we need to do, the biggest by far in cancer care, well, two, the preventative aspect before cancer and then after cancer care going, hey, why don't we now look into why cancer came? Why did it grow? Why are there weeds growing in this soil? Let's fix the soil rather than just letting it stop at the point where it traditionally does, where we go, look, we got rid of the weeds. It's fine. We have to understand why the soil is at, it, it, that's the composure of the soil and how do we do better by it? That's the main intervention that we do. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I'm very sorry to hear about your mom. My main inspiration for founding Wellbe and the work that I do came from losing my mom too. So a lot of us, um, it's very personally driven, but I think that helps keep you going when things get challenging because uh, you have something, a problem you're really trying to solve and there's no better way to be motivated to solve a problem than knowing that you had it yourself or that you experienced, you know, being a caretaker for somebody that went through that. I have two questions based on what you just said. So a sort of standard of care, conventional oncology treatment or protocol right now involves going through chemo, radiation, maybe not both if you, unless you definitely need both um, and possibly surgery if you have a tumor that you need to remove. Are there any other parts of it these days that, in, that involve, you know, a certain dietary protocol, supplements, anything else, or is that really it? Um, I mean, there's, there's many nutritionists in different hospitals that do help with patients getting them in calorically dense foods. That's one of some of the major things, right? Because patients go through a process called cachexia at some point when they're really sick, they're super inflamed and they're, they're basically not absorbing nutrients correctly. They're breaking down muscle tissue. So a lot of their focus is in that that's, that's basically cancer care nutrition is getting these folks to eat. Uh, enough calories to maintain weight, to have energy, and to go through these treatments, these really rigorous treatments, um, as strong as possible. I see. Okay. So it's more around making sure that they don't waste away rather than changing the diet that possibly could have contributed to oh, that's, having that's, cancer. Oh, that's not a product. That's not an intervention. That's not an intervention. No, not under the roof of a hospital, any hospital. That's not the intervention. It did seem that way from my experience as someone's patient advocate who was uh, going through that with a with a conventional oncologist, but you know, I didn't want to say that was the situation everywhere. Uh, it sounds like that is sort of the standard of care. So you mentioned changing, which makes a lot of sense to me, the soil when you're trying to understand where cancer ca came from to make sure it doesn't come back, which is a huge risk when going through cancer treatment is that it's going to come back and to also make sure that you support the body the best way that you can so that it actually responds well to that radiation and chemo and all of that. It's so tricky, but why is there so much cancer today? I've, I've heard people react so strongly and nastily uh, on social media to myself and other people in the integrative functional medicine world when there's any suggestion that you could have done something you know, about getting cancer, that it's, that it's not random. Um, it's very sensitive topic, but what, you, know, you obviously have a lot of statistics. I'd love for you to explain why is there more cancer today? What, what's happened in the last you know, 60, 70 years to create this rise? Um, or are we just more aware of it today? And there's always been the same cancer rates for the last you know, couple hundred years or something. No, there hasn't been the same cancer rates, but we are more aware of it. So we're diagnosing more of it. So we're seeing more of it on paper. But the rates of cancer for most cancers are going up such that uh, it's predicted around 2050, there'll be one in three uh, women and one in two men with cancer more and more and more, right? So the question is why? Well, I would disagree with anyone who says that cancer is random because it's certainly not. We have genetic predispositions. That's why cancer quote unquote runs in the family, but that genetic predisposition is about 10% of cancer, right? So if your mom had cancer, you're about 10% likely more to get it than someone who had, doesn't have a close family relative. Now, now we see that 90% of cancers right? Minimum 90% of cancers are within our power, right? Epigenetically speaking, there are inputs throughout life that influence genetic expression and or add to oxidation in the body, right? 
So yes, this is where diet, this is where infection, this is where inflammation, this is where blood sugar, this is where environmental toxins come into play. This is where stress, trauma, chronic stress, childhood trauma, these are all things. See, cancer is certainly not just one or two things. Very few and far between do people fully reverse their cancer just by going, oh, look, I just changed my diet to a better diet. I love that. And I've seen that happen, actually. Cancer completely reversed based on that. But it's few and far between. When I came into residency, I was like, oh, everyone just needs to eat more vegetables. It's what, why wouldn't, you know, the standard American diet, of course, it's going to cause cancer. Then I learned that it was just a huge pie with many different elements, many of which I just mentioned. So, um, yes, I would strongly disagree with people who say cancer is random and, you know, it's just a roulette and we don't know. One of us is going to get it. That's the most disempowered statement you can make. The most empowered statement you can make is go, okay, I wasn't taught this. Not many people are talking about it. So I forgive that. I forgive myself, right? Even if, if, if there is a cancer patient who, who has cancer now, you don't look back and go, I'm in a place where I could have done better. It's not on you. It's unfortunately, we as a society in the medical field don't put that information out actively as we put out you have cancer, come to this hospital and we're gonna do the best job. We put more money in that. More money should be in how, what preventative aspects can we do? How do we balance hormones early on to prevent things like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, right? How do we eat better? What foods are evidence-based foods that reduce oxidation in the body to prevent cancer, right? What role does blood sugar play? So many Americans are pre-diabetic and diabetic, actually, Actually, it's going to be about half in so at some point in the next 20 years. That's crazy, right? So how do we optimize the soil? And these are all the aspects that I, that I mentioned are soil. What about stress? In America, you know, it's funny, you go to Europe and you're like, wow, they, they just stress so much less than us. You know, it's, it's pretty wild. They just take them times to themselves and they really value dinners with family and community. Interestingly enough, what is the role that stress is the main biological agent in our, in our whole body? That will age us biologically more than anything, chronic stress, about 9.5 years. What, is that, what does that do for the whole body? You see what I'm saying? Like This is aspects to the soil. Unfortunately, Americans, and most people don't like to hear this because we don't want to do the work. We, we'd like to be exactly where we are. And then once an issue comes, give me medicine, give me medication to suppress it, feel better, get it out of here, and then continue on the path that we were. Unfortunately, it takes work. It takes interventions. It takes lifestyle. It takes prioritizing your health, which is something that a lot of us aren't ready for. But um, I'm not here. I'm not here saying you can fully prevent cancer by doing all these things. What I can say is you will be, I guarantee, in the best place possible to prevent it, even if your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister had cancer. I love that that the way that you switch that on its head because. I've heard parts of what you just said, but not in this way that like, I'm not saying, you know, you can totally prevent it, but you will be in the best place possible. And also you'll look your best, feel your best, you know, your risk for other chronic diseases will go down um, if you do the things that evidence and research is showing do help to prevent cancers. I've noticed it's the not wanting to do the work, but also not wanting to think it's, you know, that there's any blame or fault or just not being able to deal with any feelings like that that come up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've had to, as a patient advocate, remind a lot of chronic disease patients that those feelings are going to come up whether they're justified or not. Okay. So you have to be able to be in a place, which is where the mind body medicine comes in, to forgive yourself, to talk openly with yourself. And if you have any sort of feelings of guilt or understand them, whether they're justified or not you know, move forward. There's nowhere to go, but forward. So, um, I think that a lot of this, like cancer is random. How dare you suggest that I can do something about it comes from like also this, not wanting to deal with any sense of, you know, I could have done something or, or guilt that might come from, you know, having a diagnosis. So I asked you about the role of genetics, um, in cancer risk, which you just talked about. Are there any cancers where lifestyle plays more of a role than other cancers? When it comes to things like exercise, uh, breast, prostate cancer, colon cancer are the major ones that we see. This is what I always say. If you can put exercise's benefits and efficacy into a pill, the pharmaceutical industry would jump on it as the number one cancer treatment. Okay, so preventatively speaking, and even post-cancer care, there's reductions in 
the return of cancer, right? You keep yourself in remission longer and even preventatively, we know that what it does as far as overall health and chronic disease. So yes, there are there's some more evidence, especially for the bigger ones, right? Like colon cancer, breast cancer. I haven't seen anything on lung cancer, which is a major one too. But then that that brings that brings the intervention of like environmental medicine, right? You know, the second leading cause of lung cancer is radon. And anyone who has a home you know, needs to get their radon checked, their radon levels, right? Second leading cause of cancer behind cigarette smoking. We should talk about that more, particularly because lung cancer is then one of the number one cancers. If not, I think it is number one. So interesting is that we don't talk about these things, these interventions that we can make early on. What about breast cancer, hormonally driven cancers? What are the number one things that I talk about is hormone disruptors. Where do we find most of our hormone disruptors? certainly in some foods, but more so in things like plastics that we're using and, and exposed to every single day, right? Uh, fragrances that we're breathing in, off-gassing in things like our couches, our rugs, our beds. Whoa. And then you tell this to someone who has cancer, they go, what do you mean? My couch, my rug, and my bed gave me cancer. It's not necessarily that, but that chronically, like we're talking about dropping drips into a bucket over time, over time, five years, 10 years, this exposure is disrupting the very things that are protecting you from cancer, right? Couple that with a standard American diet, couple that with increased inflammation, blood sugar dysfunction, American life balance, lack of exercise, another chronic disease, family history, and trauma from childhood or something like that. And, you and since you were talking about uh, female, you know, breast cancer, throw in synthetic birth control pills. Yeah, so, so <laughs> put this as a whole, what you have to think about the, the main mechanisms is what drives the cancer, right? And we don't talk about it enough in the medical field, but again, going back to someone who, the, the, this figurative person that's diagnosed with cancer, they don't, they, they're not told this, they can't blame themselves. It's like it's something is revealed to you five years later and you go, whoa, what do you mean? Like the land that I was on had radon. I didn't know that, no one told me. I didn't even, what's, what is radon? See what I'm saying? Yeah, the lack of awareness in education, it's simply an a, a elemental gas that's released um, it, it can come through cement, it can come through pipes, it can come through walls on many of uh, the, on the foundation of a house because of the dirt it's built on. Most people have a radon inspection before. And, and it's funny because I, I, talk, I haven't talked about this in a while, but yeah, like if you are a homeowner, get your radon level checked and make sure that it's safe. If, if it's a number two leading cause of lung cancer, why isn't the American consciousness going, whoa, cigarettes cause lung cancer. Oh shoot, but so does radon. You see what I mean? Why aren't we talking about that enough? The same thing goes, why aren't we talking about plastics as much as we are going, actually, I don't know what people are saying what causes breast cancer, but why aren't we talking about plastics as the leading cause of breast cancer? Because it certainly is one of the leading cause of hormone disruption. And we know for a fact, hormone disruption is a driving force of breast cancers, uterine cancers, right? So I'm trying to illuminate the lack of education in the American public purposeful or not, I don't know where it is, but there's just not enough education for people to go, you mean to tell me I can just switch to a glass or stainless steel water bottle instead of drinking my Poland Springs every single day? You mean to tell me they make beds that are better quality that are not off-gassing hormone disruptors all night while I'm sleeping on it? You see what I mean? So how do we empower people? And that's sort of the work that I've been doing and a lot of my colleagues. Yes, that's that's a, just, a, just a huge part of, well, these mission as well. I want to circle back to um, the kind of conventional cancer therapies, uh, specifically radiation and chemo, you were talked about how they were very, very serious and hard on the body, even though they can be life-saving, but you know, in order to get there, your body goes through hell. Uh, immunotherapy drugs, these are new in cancer treatment, and it seems like a more promising solution um, than some of these like knock you down, drag you out treatments like radiation. Do they have the same tough effect on the body? I mean, they're pharmaceutical, obviously, so they're not natural the way that these natural interventions like diet are that we spoke about or removing hormone disruptors. But do you think it's a little bit more of a naturopathic solution than uh, chemo and radiation? Yeah, I think, I think in 50 years or 70 years, We'll look back and we'll go, oh my God, how are we treating cancer like that? That was that was barbaric. It was brutal. It was not sophisticated. I think we are moving towards more sophisticated approaches. And to say that, I mean, there's a spectrum of chemo, right? Some of the chemos are are really, really tough on the body. 
some, you know, patients go through it. You can, you can tell they're going through some treatment, but they're, they're much stronger. Right. And it depends on different other factors too. The, the, the constitution as a whole of the person, their, their health before the intervention, as far as immunotherapy, it seems like it has a less, less of a symptom profile, right? Side effect profile. Um, the risk though with immunotherapy is that it can provoke an autoimmune disease, right? So, so let's say I'm getting immunotherapy for my lung. Unfortunately, at some point there's a risk and, and, it's, and it's there the risk that my body can start attacking my liver, right? My body can start attacking my eyes. So that's a problem. But you see how it's still not sophisticated enough but I think it's moving towards the right direction. Um, with that said, immunotherapy is not um, indicated for all types of cancer, um, only a few. The last I checked when I was in residency, we were doing it for lung cancer, we were doing it for skin cancer. So it, again, it's not all cancers. A limited amount compared to all the cancers out there, yeah. But it seems to be better than some of the chemotherapies I saw for lung cancer and skin cancer. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification because I think certain people I know that talked about cancer talk about it like, you know, similar to how people talk about the COVID vaccine, like, oh, it's just this miracle, like we've been waiting for, and this will solve all these problems. When in fact, there's a different set of risks, uh, but there are risks and it's not for every cancer and, and it might end up being that way. But right now it's, you know, limited. Um, I'll say this, we are far from a cancer cure. We are not near it. We are not near it because not, we're not working in the correct paradigm. The paradigm we're working in is, oh, there's a tumor. How do we get rid of the tumor as fast as possible? We will find a cure for cancer when we understand why the body is in the state that it is, right? When we understand how to work with the body, that's when we will find a cure. We're on the wrong baseball field, right? We're, we're, in, we're in the Oakland A's athletic field when we should be in the LA Dodgers one where that's the answers. You see what I mean? Completely wrong. Ooh, that's, I feel like Oakland people would take some I know. Or, vice, or vice versa. <laughs> I lived in both. That's why I, it's the first thing that came to my head. That's funny. Um, I, just as you were saying that, I was thinking about even the way that people speak about it. Like there's a big hashtag on social media, you know, cancer sucks. I'm sure you've seen that given yeah. your work. And it's to me such a, I think incorrect way of thinking about the process because it's making this tumor inside you the enemy, like this vicious, right. you know, villain of a tumor that ended up there. Meanwhile, your body created that tumor. It's part of you. It's inside you. I think once oncology, and I don't think that this will ever happen, but once oncology goes, damn, why don't we just change this whole paradigm and really figure out why don't we work with the body instead of villainizing everything? And, 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 I, and look, I understand where they're going. A tumor will kill you, right? If, if a tumor is impinging on an organ that is essential for life function, which is essentially all the organs, then it will kill you. But the question is, is how do we develop an understanding that is working with that understanding too? But um, to be honest, I don't think that's where the money is. Yeah. It, to me, another analogy that I just thought of was sort of like, um, you know, getting a divorce and or, or trying to avoid getting a divorce and um, not understanding how you got to that place to begin with, just dealing with like the acute like divorce issue, not trying to work backwards and say, what led us to get to the point where we wanted to get divorced? And then once we figure that out, we can understand a lot more about how to treat this divorce or treat this cancer. And I think that's the paradigm shift that you're referring to is that if we don't understand the root causes of these cancers and, and really empower people to understand the, how their lifestyle and everything that's happened to them, even if it was something they didn't know about, like radons, um, or, you know, uh, I remember my mom didn't die of cancer, but she had this job for a year or two, like refurbishing furniture, antique furniture for this family that sold them all in these, you know, auction sites or something. So I think she like worked in a garage with toxic chemical stripping furniture for two straight years. Yeah. Of course that can have a role in later things, even if at the time nobody warned her about that, or it's not to say, you know, she did all these things that she should be blamed for. It was just one of those things, you know, that contributed to her toxic load. I think there's a lot of that. And when people can acknowledge, oh, these things happened to me, or I was doing these things and boom, 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 here we are. How do I undo 
those things go backwards, kind of wiggle back into it while also, you know, saving my life. Um, they'll be in the Dodger stadium or the right playing field. Really quick. The one point you made that was really resonated with me is the word divorce. If you add a place with your partner and that's on the table, like that's the tumor of the relationship, then it gives you the relativity to look back and go, shit, we've gotten to a place where the, the word divorce is on the table. We've gotten to a place where the manifestation tumor is on the table and it, it, it forces you. And, and this is the, this is the difference. A lot of people go divorce. That's it. Irreconcilable differences. We don't get along. Right. Same thing. We go tumor. That's it. Cut it out and get back to old living. But if we stop and we go, damn, divorce is on the table. Damn tumors on the table. How do we go back and understand how we got here? Unfortunately, the tools and especially us as doctors, we don't empower patients enough to understand how did we get here? The same goes with divorce attor attorneys, right? They, they, that, that's their job to just break them up. But, but instead, how do we look back and go, relatively speaking, how do we get here? So it was something that really resonated with me, the analogy. I want to circle back to the fact that you practice uh, naturopathic oncology because it's, I hope, is the future of all oncology, but it's still a relatively small percentage of the oncology practice in the US. Like, mm -hmm. do you know the percentage? Is it 10%, 5%? 1%, 2%, very tiny. 1%, 2%. Okay, even smaller than I thought. In your experience, you know, in both in residency with, with patients um, and all of your research, uh, do certain cancers respond better to this naturopathic or, or functional approach? Or do all cancers seem to, you said it was like night and day, respond mm -hmm. better? Um, and what be, you know, you sort of already alluded to it, but like, what are those things that the naturopathic oncology community is focusing on really intensely that the standard of care conventional oncology protocol doesn't include? Well, it, without speaking in absolutes, almost every single patient who underwent integrative cancer care went through chemo, radiation, surgery, one or all, or two or three, all of them much, much better. And when I say much better, if anyone, viewers or listeners know, I'm sure we all know someone who went through cancer care, but if you're with them day in and day out, it, it's, it's horrible. It's really difficult, right? You know, they're throwing up a few times a day. They're losing weight. They have zero energy to get up, right? Seeing them as a shell of themselves um, is very difficult, even the losing the hair process. So there are interventions, evidence-based interventions in studies that we see are helpful. So the way that I worked in my program is, of course, the only intervention we can give has to be safe or effective. So the whole toolkit that we worked with was based on the evidence. And fortunately enough, when we do those evidence-based interventions, these patients do much better through treatment. Now, at the time, I, I couldn't follow them over the years. It, it, the design was that I just saw different patients all the time. I didn't. I wasn't working with one patient over time or a group of patients. So, and nor did we run any studies going, okay, what about two years, three years, five years, 10 years following these interventions? And it sort of hazes because then you go, okay, well, look, they're cancer free after 10 years. Was it the conventional therapies exclusively? Was it the naturopathic therapies exclusively? Or was it both synergistically? But the, the, the better question is to go, how do we get this in every single hospital, right? And look, I have no stake in this. I, I don't practice anymore. So I, I don't I mean, like, I'm not, I don't see cancer patients. I haven't in the past two and a half years, but I believe that every single cancer hospital in America and in the world should have at least one integrative naturopathic oncology uh, expert on hand to help these patients. Cause it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. They get a mastectomy. We, we, we support them five days before Five days after, they're, they're out of the hospital. Symptoms are better, reduced inflammation, reduced swelling, reduced pain. You see what I'm saying? Very and safe and effective intervention. So I really think that there's a plate, there's more than a place. There's essentially what we do is, is incredible work. Um, and I know you're probably going to ask where does someone who's listening find it? They can go into uh, ONCANP, oncanp.org. That's the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. And there you can find tons of information. You can type in breast cancer and find in like all of these alternative articles that'll really start empowering you. You can learn more, but at that, you can go into the database in your location and find. Now it's not in all states, but if it's in your state, 
or close to your state, you can find the nearest practitioner who's an expert in this, right? Who has seen thousands of cancer patients like me, right? Who has taken the board certification test, right? So they, so you know, this is some, this is an expert that I need to work with. And how great is that? So even if you're working, you're in a hospital, you can have an integrative practitioner working with the team in the hospital. Now, most oncologists don't even want to be involved in that. That's fine. But I've, I've came across many oncologists who are like, hey, let's work together. This is, this is how it should be. Teach me some stuff. How do we work on this? I go, yeah, let's work on this. Why are we doing this? The collaboration is beautiful because that energy is so much better for the patient. I've had people ask me in the past, okay, so if I have a naturopathic oncologist or holistic, functional, all these terms, uh, do I even need a conventional oncologist then? You should go to a conventional oncologist, get testing, get imaging, hear what they say, because I'm not a alternative cancer doctor. I am an integrative cancer doctor, meaning that my training is in working with the conventional therapies, right? That's a standard of care. Um, are there people out there doing otherwise and reversing cancers? I'm sure. But my training is only in the integrative aspect. Right. My question was more the things like imaging and like uh, administering chemotherapy when needed and stuff. Do that with the conventional. Okay. So naturopathic oncologists don't really do that okay. as much. Yeah. Just like you wouldn't hear an oncologist go, here's your list of supplements that are going to help you get through chemo and radiation, right? Or just like you won't hear an oncologist go, you're done with cancer. And now let's get to the root of why it came. Unfortunately. But, that's but I think people feel it should be that way. That's what's so confusing. Of course it should. Of course it should. There's no question. Every oncologist who practices cancer care, right? Oncology. Every oncologist should be equipped with the tool belt to go. Now that we've gotten rid of the tumor, let's find out why you had cancer. They should be equipped with that tool belt. They don't know what tests to do right? They don't know what to look for. Most aren't trained in environmental medicine, if any. Certainly most aren't trained in the nutrition aspect. Certainly most aren't trained in the mind-body aspect. Rightfully so, their training and their time has to go into everything that they're doing. I'm not villainizing them at all. Right. This is their job. Their tool belt, their tool belt has A, B, C. That's it. But right. And like you were saying, we're so far from a cancer cure and it's still so complicated that even just the administering of chemo, radiation, and surgery for cancer tumors, and the testing that goes along with it, and understanding all that is so complicated currently that perhaps that's really all they have room for in their training. Again, none of this podcast is to put down any oncologist. I work with some incredible ones whose heart are in the right place, right? But they're only trained to treat the end stage manifestation, right? Basically, these are experts in treating the end stage of divorce, like divorce. That's it. They only treat the divorce aspect. I was just about to say, they're like the best of the best divorce attorney. They're not supposed to help you understand how to save your marriage or what happened and how you could be a better spouse to either this person or the next person. They're just here to get you the most money and the best yeah, settlement right, from this divorce. Exactly. But you see how incomplete that is. You see how that's maybe... 5%, 10% of care. The, the best model is, all right, let's get a divorce attorney in case we do get divorced. But if and when there is the time where we go, let's fix this, let's get healthier, let's, let's salvage this, right? Let's save a life. Let's take that microscope, which covers more, right? So I said ABC, what about D to Z? D to Z needs to be covered. We're going home with that completely in the unknown. Let's put the magnifying glass on there and go, whoa, okay, here's some education. Here's some interventions, you know, like knock on wood. I mean, every single cancer patient I had in my life after residency, minus one is cancer free with the longest one being seven years cancer free. And this was stage three breast cancer, an aggressive one. She's exclusively doing naturopathic therapies at this point. See what I mean? She's exclusively changing her lifestyle. We, we did every single test, you know, and that's incredible. That's incredible. The fact that like we can restore health to these people, we can fix the soil. Essentially what I was doing when I was practicing was fixing the soil. Now I'm educating people on how to fix the soil themselves without even taking money out of their pocket and paying, which is interestingly enough, right? This is my community. I'm helping people save money, paying naturopathic doctors, save money, paying 
uh, functional doctors and going here, do this yourself. So we prevent anything that could have come. See what I mean? So that's yeah. sort of work that I find more important at this point. Yeah. So you mentioned naturopathic interventions and I think we've alluded to what they are more or less uh, diet being a big piece of it, getting hormone disruptors out of your environment. But what would you say are, you know, the top five tools that naturopathic interventions come up with or that are most effective at, for example, your stage three breast cancer patient keeping cancer in remission? Balancing hormones. Uh, so taking a hormone test that is not readily used in conventional medicine. There's many out there, Dutch test being by far the best one. And if you have breast cancer, you take this every six months minimum, right? And I've seen the power of naturopathic interventions, balance hormones, exclusively naturopathic interventions, fully balance hormones in women with breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Balance the hormones, taking a complete audit of your exposures in your home, optimize air quality in your home and at work, wherever you are most of your day, including things like mold, a complete audit on your nutrition. Are you eating nutritionally dense foods throughout the day? What foods are not serving your body? Take a complete audit on your gut health because if you're not absorbing any of those nutritious foods, then we, what are we doing? What are we working for? And then the mind-body aspect. If you're carrying a lead book bag of trauma, that you've had since childhood or teenage, teenagehood. I, I'll be honest, I've, I've had patients who completely reversed their cancer doing, they, they were doing all the right things, right? Everything that you would think, oh, I'm eating better, I'm working out. I even got rid of the stuff in my home, but it wasn't to the point where they forgave someone from their past that they needed to, that that's what, you see what I'm saying? That that's what put the, that's what opened up the floodgates. So it's not even to be minimized. This is in no particular order. They're all just as important. If you don't handle that mind-body aspect of stress that is chronically activating your brain, chronically activating your adrenals, chronically activating your sympathetic nervous system, that is chronically increasing inflammation, that is chronically reducing your immune system health every single day, then, then what are we doing, right? So we're reducing that inflammation, balancing the body. So the mind-body aspect cannot be understated. And this is where a different expertise come in. So those are the five things that I would say, quick interventions. You can do this over months, right? Two, three months, you're already on the best place you've ever been in your life, even if you had cancer. Okay. I love those. Those are a lot of things that WellBe focuses on as well, because it's across the board, chronic disease healing, Yeah. Um, not just cancer, as you know, uh, that, that, that those five things are really key for. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned the inflammation thing because inflammation well, and gut health, but inflammation comes up a lot uh, with the various guests and investigative guides that we do um, because the body doesn't understand where the inflammation is coming from. It just knows there's stagnating inflammation or stagnating energy. So whether that's not being able to forgive somebody or environmental toxins in your home or processed foods in your diet it's sort of having the same effect. And so that's how I like to explain to people that can't really wrap their head around how can not forgiving somebody have the same impact as chemicals in my home on sure. cancer. And it's because once it's in your body, your body is treating it all the same. It's, it's you know just something that's causing the organs and systems to not function at their best. Sure. But I want to circle back to something that you said earlier that I have a question about, and that's there are a lot a lot, as you know, of alternative cancer websites and resources, not naturopathic or integrative necessarily, but alternative, meaning um, focus on the things outside of uh, chemo, radiation, and surgery that can help with uh, cancer prevention, but mostly cancer recovery. And are there any that you, being in the world of, you know, kind of bridging both, um, are there any that you advise any cancer patients your own in the past or, or currently against looking into or learning from? Because I've always been sort of a, you should be able to discern that. I'm not into censor censorship. At the same time, I've seen some kind of wacky ones out there. And I wondered what your advice is on that topic. I think more of the alternative treatments out there are harmful than good. Um, I think there are ones that can absolutely help patients with cancer. I think there's ones that we don't have enough evidence on and are more likely than not safe. 
but I can't recommend that. I can't, right? My training is only to recommend what we know evidence-based will be helpful. Um, with that said, let's say you are looking to do something outside of the standard and or the integrative model, then this is a question for your integrative doctor, right? Your naturopathic doctor. So they themselves can go, damn, I've never heard of this thing that, that's going on in Germany, but a lot of conventional doctors are doing it out there and it's, it's sort of becoming towards a standard out there. So let me do the research. So they can, they can save you the time of going, is this like, is this valid research? Is the body of evidence showing that it, it actually can be helpful? Is it, is it emerging research that it shows it's, it's possible that we can do something? Cause a lot of people go, I have cancer and I'm not going to do chemo radiation and surgery and, or I'm going to do it. It didn't work. I need to go somewhere else, like to this country to do these things that I heard that my aunt's best friend got cured by. I can't speak to all of that, right? Like there's so much, but I think that this is a really good place for pay, uh, when people find their naturopathic, integrative naturopathic doctor, we can help you. We can go, let me give you the right evidence. You make an informed decision yourself. And even if I say, this is not good, stay away. It's still, it's, you're empowered to do what you want, but still we're giving you all the information that you need to make a good scientific intervention on in your life. Yes. And I believe so strongly that having that integrative naturopathic oncology physician is, is critical for a cancer patient. I, I have seen situations though, where people are either on, you know, Medicare or just really struggling to make ends meet. And so their conventional cancer care is covered by their, either their insurance or Medicare, but they don't have much disposable income outside of that. And so they're trying to do the things that they know might help on their own and just using the internet as their, you know, sort of doctor. And it's not, I mean, it's not the way to go about it. You need someone who has expertise to help you. I just run into that a few times where I don't know how to advise because uh, I can't say go spend money on something that, you know, may not be covered and therefore be out of pocket, but also you can't just use like every person that says they've worked sure. cured from cancer as a reputable source. Like it's just very confusing. So I'm glad you uh, have run into that too. You mentioned the um, naturopathic oncology website. I forget the, exactly what the acronym was, but are there other resources that you recommend to people um, who may have a cancer diagnosis or a loved one that does um, who are trying to, let's say a naturopathic oncologist uh, is not available in their state um, you know, what, what else should they turn to? There's not much. Unfortunately, there's not many resources that are alternative that are for me on my, my percent that I would go, that's trustworthy, right? They use enough evidence that is verifiable enough that you can go, okay, I feel comfortable with this. It's really just an oncology association of naturopathic physicians, onc AMP, you know, and, um, there's the American association of naturopathic physicians, AAMP, and, that's overall health, right? You can really look at some good articles. Um, NDNR, that is a uh, publication of alternative uh, naturopathic doctors where you can learn more about. It's really good for doctors out there too. Those are the three places that I would look, starting with the ONCANP, Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Okay, got it. So we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you two more questions, one of which should be quick. The other one, I'm not sure. Based on everything that you know from your training and your experience, both working directly with patients and then also advising people, not you know, a direct patients, but more in a digital way, what are the most important or valuable lessons you've learned about integrative oncology and what really works? I know you talked about the tools, um, those five really important tools. So accessing those or making sure you're practicing those and having somebody that's really evidence-based and open-minded that you can speak to like a naturopathic oncologist, but just what are those things that have stood out and you're just like, yes, that's a key that works. The mind body part, the mind body part is a key. It is, if not the key, it is, it's incredible what patients feel in their overall liberation and then how the other aspects and other interventions are even more powerful when they get their mind body connection, right? When they, go deep into their traumas, they go deep into their chronic stress that could have essentially been the biggest piece of the pie for why cancer came. That needs to be reconciled for every cancer patient. Yeah, um, I'm glad that you mentioned the chronic stress element too, because some people have said to me whenever I bring this topic up for chronic disease, 
Um, yeah, I, I had a pretty good childhood. Like I don't feel any traumas. I'm, I'm good. And almost like, Oh, you must be digging for something that's wrong with me. Like I'm a pretty happy, fine person. I just have, you know, Lyme disease or I just have lupus or whatever. Um, but it's also just the chronic stress elements and how are they, are they feeling purposeful? Are they actually happy? <laughs> are yeah. they uh, doing things routinely, right? That can help purpose. to minimize stress. Sense of purpose. What is your life, right? Like these are bigger questions that we need to ask. What is your sense of purpose? Because a driver in your longevity is, if not the driver of longevity aside from community is sense of purpose. Why are you here on earth, right? Like. Your body knows if you're not fulfilling a bigger picture, you know, we're, we didn't come to earth to sit behind a cubicle, you know, and type behind a computer for eight hours a day. It's not, it's not why we're here. So again, that's, this is the work that needs to be done for every patient, not just cancer patient. And we are doing it. And, and the beautiful thing is that we can get so many people healthy doing it. Yeah. I love that. Um, all right. My very last question for you, and this is something that I ask every guest on this show, um, is how do you quote unquote, get wellby? Get wellby is our website uh, URL, but also all of our social media handles and our hashtag. But most of all, I think it's the get as part of, you know, the, the title, even though wellby is the company name is important because like you said, health takes work. You have to do the work. Good health isn't just going to happen. It's not like the luck of the draw. And so I always ask, you know, how do you get well? Be what are those can't miss? No matter what crazy day you're having, where you've got to meet that deadline or everything goes wrong, do you still make sure to do in order to keep yourself well and prevent chronic disease in the future? I get well be by doing rituals. Rituals are the number one thing that I think anyone can do for their health. Because when you do rituals, you set aside time for yourself every single day. And by setting aside time for yourself every single day, you start creating more of the things that we spoke about. Sense of purpose, self-awareness. You start releasing and reducing that trauma that you have every single day. You start empowering yourself to go through the day much more vigilant in everything you're doing, much more purposeful in everything you're doing. If you're not doing rituals, I believe you're living in autopilot. If you're living in autopilot, all of a sudden things come to you, right? Things in life come to you, but also diseases arise out of nowhere. When you're empowered, conscious, and doing things like rituals to create that space, then all of a sudden you're, you're driving your life. And that's the most powerful thing you can do. That's great. No, I love that. So you'll have to tell me what your ritual is then, of course. I think that's a whole nother show, to be honest. There's so <laughs> I do. affirmations, gratitude, uh, cold shower. I make myself a matcha every morning. I journal. I visualize what my life is going to look like. Visualize my physical health, mental health. There's, this is not woo woo. This is just, it's, it's the most, some of the most incredible mind body work you can do. Ground every single day, hike, move. It's, it's my time, you know, and me is the most important person in my whole life. And by, by me prioritizing me, I get to help my family, I get to help my friends, and I get to help millions of people at this point, which is incredible. I love that. So quick, back of the napkin, how many hours a day do you do rituals? One, two? It depends. On average, probably two hours, but most people don't have two hours, so make it 30 minutes. Uh, just put in there what's most important to you. For me, I have the luxury to do two hours of rituals, and that's important for me. Sometimes, if when I'm in the rush, I'll do 30 minutes. I'll get in a meditation, some breath work, and a cold shower right? But I can't miss my matcha. That's like sort of my tasty reward for all of it. Yes. I uh, have the same process. My tasty reward is a decaf, organic coffee, uh, and my like walk by the ocean. That's my uh, reward for doing the other hard stuff. Well, Christian, Dr. G, as uh, you're known, thank you so much for sharing all this insight. Cancer is something that young people, middle-aged people, old people, are concerned about, like you said, the rates and the awareness is much higher. And yet we are still very far from a cure. And we've been thinking about it in a totally different paradigm or playing field from what's actually needed to really get a handle on it as a society, as a whole, you know, earth, humanity. And so the questions and the nerves around it, uh, both when it's in your family or something you're dealing with yourself and just thinking about it, like it's this thing out there that could happen. Um, hearing from you and hearing that there's there are approaches and certain lifestyle interventions that can really help. And we've seen that with evidence and research, I think should be super empowering and really reassuring that 
this isn't just something that's inevitable or is going to be a horrible thing to go through. It doesn't have to be. Exactly. So thank you for all of that. I certainly feel reassured. I'm going to be spending more time tomorrow morning on my rituals. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.